All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Menegakis, and thank you for joining us with South Carolina for Criminal Justice Reform, SC for CJR. And tonight, we are super excited to have a great panel today. And what we're doing today is talking about different um, problems in the police system, in the criminal justice system, specifically when it comes to police um, and policing and policies. A lot of organizations have proposed certain solutions to problems that we see and problems that happen, example, with George Floyd. So today we're gonna be the first episode of dissecting these policies and the problems, and we are interviewing experts in this area. Today we're focusing on qualified immunity and use of force. Um, I'm joined here by my co-host and awesome executive board member of SC for CGR, um, Tola Famaloni. Tola is here. Um, we also have amazing guests, um, professors, from South Carolina, um, Scott Anthony and Seth Stoughton. Scott Anthony um, is a local. He is a, not only an attorney who practices constitutional civil rights issues and civil litigation, but he is also a professor at the Charleston School of Law and he teaches constitutional law and legal writing and he is going to be educating all of us um, on qualified immunity and how that works and what it means. Also joining us today is Seth Stoughton, Professor Seth Stoughton. He is from the University of South Carolina School of Law, and he um, is one of the experts when it comes to use of force and policing. He has been featured um, in different, many different law reviews. He's been um, featured in the Time Magazine, uh, The Atlantic. He's featured regularly um, on a uh, CNN, NPR, and um, he's been very busy these days and we're so grateful that he's able to take some time out of his busy week and join us today. And he's going to be telling us all about use of force and excessive use of force. He um, also has a book that just came out last month, y'all. It's called Evaluating Police Uses of Force and it's available on Amazon. We're gonna put a link to that after this um, webinar is done. And he also was nice enough to give us a discount code if you're interested in purchasing that. Um, it can also be purchased on the publishing website. He also um, recently published an op-ed in The Atlantic um, titled, How to Actually Fix America's Police. So we're gonna be putting a link to that as well for all of you. Um, but thank you so much and welcome. Um, um, Scott, do you want to just introduce, introduce yourself and say anything to our viewers? Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak. Uh, take the expert uh, in the loosest form uh, that you possibly can. And, uh, you know, I want to talk to you all a little bit uh, about just qualified immunity. Um, Alec, if it's okay, I'll just go ahead and, and get started. I know we've, you know, got a lot that you want to cover tonight. Um, you know, yeah, qualified. Let me just let Scott, um, Seth introduce himself first, and then we're oh, going to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm looking forward to, to getting to it. So let's, by all means, let's do it. And um, Scott, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pull up that PowerPoint for you that you have for us, right? Okay. Yes, please. Did I do that? Okay. Sure. Thank you. So uh, while she's bringing that up, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, you know, qualified immunity is uh, arguably uh, incredibly a dense subject that I always tell my law students, I, I know it's a dense subject and I know it's confusing when I go to read a Supreme Court or appellate court decision and, and it's pages and pages and pages of dissecting these, these really esoteric issues and it's impossible to kind of figure out what's going on without reading it five times. And, and I think the qualified immunity is, is right in there um, as far as things that you're not going to necessarily understand the first time you pick it up. Um, but I think it's an important issue. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, right now in the world. Um, you know, I was just talking to the panel prior to y'all getting on, um, you know, some of the concerns that we had with COVID and your constitutional rights, um, with all the, the recent instances uh, with Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and, and everyone else. Uh, there's been so much talk about the excessive force and other issues. So I want to tell you briefly and kind of in a, in a way that the kind of simplify where your rights are as far as how do you go against uh, a government entity or official um, if you feel like one of your rights are violated. Um, so I, I like to start it off with, which is a couple of quotes. We're not going to spend any time on them, but I think that they were pretty poignant. I like to do it for my class to try to give them a little perspective. Um, 
because people don't want to to ask hard questions. They don't want to to um, cause themselves a headache, you know, as Catherine would say. Um, and and so uh, I think it's really important that that y'all are on this call, that y'all are y'all are acting and y'all are being a part of it because uh, that's what our system is built on. Um, it, it's not just attorneys, but but everyone as citizens um, speaking out and de and defending the liberties because if they're not applied equally, then they're at risk for all of us. Um, and, and I think that's absolutely fundamental and, and undeniable. So what is immunity? Well, in the COVID world, we've all, we all understand the medical sense of immunity in, in the sense that, hey, you're not going to get whatever illness or whatever hardship um, that may come to you. In, in a legal sense, it's protection or exemption from something, um, you know, an obligation or a penalty. Um, specifically, it, it, qualified immunity is basically saying, these people shouldn't have to be subjected to the hardship that is litigation. They shouldn't have to subject themselves to being a defendant. And so to that end, it's really the first test or, or arguably the first test that the courts are ever going to, to look at when they're investigating, um, do you have a right to bring um, a potential claim that your constitutional rights were violated, okay? You've got to show eventually that your rights were violated and that they did enact, act improperly under the Constitution. But before you even get there, you've got to show that, they have a, they, that they're even subject to, to the lawsuit that you're bringing, okay? And that's what immunity is all about. Um, so we talk about the constitutional authority for it. So I guess originally the, the issue with immunity is gonna start with Article Three of the Constitution, which is judiciary. Um, in Chisholm versus Georgia, and I spelled it wrong, there's an L in there, I apologize. Um, in Chisholm versus Georgia, the Supreme Court um, allowed an individual um, to enforce his contracts um, against the state of Georgia for the contracts that he had done for supplying goods during the Revolutionary War. Um, and they brought the action. What freaked all the states out so much that an individual could sue the states um, that, you know, with other things is always the history, but in essence, they came out with the 11th Amendment um, to, to prevent that, okay? Um, since that time, the 11th Amendment has been basically applied to all citizens to say that you're not going to be able to sue the government um, uh, against, you know, you're not going to be able to sue a state um, in, in federal court. And so what it's done is kind of created this blanket um, protection that if it applies, you're not going to be able to subject that person to liability for whatever injury it is. Okay. Um, so what is qualified immunity? Well, it is what it sounds like, right? Um, if you qualify for it, that you're immune, okay? So there's a difference. You might have heard of absolute immunity, okay? Generally speaking, that's going to be judges, prosecutors, legislators, you know, high-ranking officials um, that are doing something within the scope of their, their duty, their task, whatever their job is. Um, and they're going to have that absolute uh, immunity from that, meaning that as long as they don't, generally speaking, generally speaking, as long as they don't act with malice or otherwise, um, uh, you know, improper motive as far as corrupt fraud, something like that, they're going to be protected in that sense. Um, it can always rise above that, um, whether, you know, I think one of the times we hear about it the most is, you know, a president can't be sued. Well, it depends on what a president does. Can we, you know, an absolute immunity, um, you know, think of, uh, um, a mayor making good or bad decisions about flood control, right? Whatever your position is, you can't necessarily sue them um, if you say they had a bad decision, right? They're going to have immunity from their decisions, even if you can show that it that it harmed you, as long as they're acting um, in the scope, okay? Uh, the, the scope being what they're tasked with doing. Um, obviously, with anything in the law, there are great exceptions to everything I'm saying, um, but generally speaking, okay? Um, it gets more complicated than that as you look into it, because what if it's prosecutors? Well, uh, there's exculpatory evidence, which is evidence that would go to help um, the defendant in a case, okay? So there's an obligation that a prosecutor pre presents the evidence they have that they're gonna try to use against the defendant, even if it would hurt their position, even if it would help the defendant. Um, and generally speaking, even if they don't hand it over, the, the prosecutors are still gonna be protected by immunity. Uh, that changes if they're acting uh, in a police force or a police function. So if they're assisting and, and serving more as a police officer in that sense, you know, detective and, and participating really hands-on with that, um, then that's going to kind of erode a lot of their rights uh, towards immunity. So why do we have this qualified immunity? 
is because it's important to have the balancing test of um, holding public officials accountable for, for improper actions at the same time recognizing that humans are fallible and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to do things that might not have been the best possible way to do it. Um, in business, in essence, and in business, we call it the business judgment rule, that the boards or, or executives of the business can make decisions if they make a mistake, as long as they, generally speaking, acted properly and did some of their other requirements, we're going to say, hey, everybody's entitled to mistakes. And that is, in essence, what the qualified immunity is, except it goes a step further in that it really provides deference to those government officials to say, hey, we know you're in a tough spot and we know that no politician has ever gotten 100 percent of the vote. And, and as such, we're going to help you out when mistakes are made. Um, so so when does that apply? Like I said, it, it applies when an individual um, or a plaintiff files an action against a government official. Generally speaking, it is going to be against an individual. Um, generally speaking, you're not going to be bringing actions um, against the, the government as a sense, like, for instance, say, for a duty to train. Um, and, and we'll get to that later. But you would be bringing it potentially as a whole for their, you know, basically just ignoring the policy that they're required to do. But otherwise, it's generally speaking, an individual or individuals against a state of individual. Um, and and you're, you're, you're alleging that you've been violated of your constitutional rights. And I've got in here, it has to be clearly established. And so that's where the rub really comes with these immunity issues is if, you know, um, we all talk about excessive force. Um, and, you know, if a cop is or a, a border patrol or any other law enforcement officer stops somebody by shooting them, um, well, we know that there's a, been a seizure. Okay. And so there's probably, uh, hopefully, you know, if they're bringing the action, one could assume there's enough evidence to kind of get over that initial burden of showing, hey, there's enough to say, was this an un, uh, unreasonable seizure? Um, and to do that, you know, you've got to get past that first step, which is the immunity. Um, but in that sense, it's pretty obvious, hey, if you shoot somebody and there is a constitutional right against unlawful seizure and the shooting was unlawful, then any reasonable officer in that situation should have known it was a clearly established um, rule. It becomes more time consuming depending on how gray of a rule it is. Um, we, you know, we're going to talk about the uh, assemblies, like the peaceful protests or non-peaceful protests, and where that goes. Um, but it's an objective test when it deciding, hey, is it a clearly established statutory right uh, or statutory or constitutional right? Um, it's it's when it's objective in the sense is would a reasonable officer or officers in that situation or officials in that situation recognize that that bio, there was a clear violation happening at the time? Um, you can't play hindsight police okay so you can't come back and look at it after you've spent days and times examining it it's more like a test given to a referee before we are not allowed uh, instant replay you got to make an a, you know an on the ground decision to the best of your ability based on the information that's available to you okay and, and and there's a little word that they use a lot is that it's fair warning so sometimes there might be an issue um that that maybe is not as obvious as as you know lethal force from a police officer as to whether that would potentially violate a constitutional right of seizure. Um, and they'll look to then, hey, would a reasonable person have had fair warning? And, and I think you can take it pretty literal in the sense of, um, is it reasonable that in that situation, most people would know that, hey, even if I've never heard this is a violation, I know it's not proper, okay? It's to that, okay? Um, and that it's got to be whatever you're doing that caused that has got to be part of the, it's got to be a sensitive function. Um, you know, for instance, police officers detaining people, trying to arrest people, um, it's a sensitive part of what they're doing. It's an important function of what they're doing. We understand that there are going to be times that it's done improperly. Um, but once we have that, then you have to act, uh, make sure that it was acting, um, that it was important to that position when it was violated, okay? Um, and so, Basically, even if you have the authority and you're serving an important function, at, you know, as a police officer or, or any other official, is the reason that you're trying to enforce it or potentially infringing on that right, was it really that important at the moment? You know, could it have been done at a different time? Could you have dressed it in a different way? Okay. Um, so, so we, we talked about when you would try to bring an action against somebody. And, and, and you know, we, we have some of the common ones, excessive force, the unlawful search and seizures. Um, 
there's times where you have to really get into uh, the the nit and gritty of whether they would have had, you know, it was reasonable for them to know it was a constitutional violation. Um, for instance, when they're serving faulty warrants um, or, or school officials. Um, I want to talk about school officials for a while because, um, you know, you have so many times where people are searched um, because, you know, there's exceptions to when a person can do a search without a warrant uh, on a student. If they're doing it, what we call an exigent circumstance, which is kind of an emergency. For instance, if they saw bruises on somebody and they thought it was um, abuse, um, they're going to have times where they could go in that. And that may be part of that important function and carrying out that important aspect of that function in order to, to protect that child from future harm. Um, similarly, there's been times where the, the, the schools have taken that same liberty to try to search somebody for, for drugs or anything like that. Um, and then you're going to have the test of whether it was a proper search. But before they do that, again, it's a matter of, is this an important task that they're doing? Um, is it, you know, the, the, the task in general? And at the time that they try to do it, is that, that important? Okay. Um, and so, you know, you have issues uh, with invasion of privacy uh, where, where somebody will say, oh, you, you executed a warrant improperly. You're in my house. You shouldn't have been doing that. On top of that, uh, you invaded my privacy. While they might have a cleaner argument as a plaintiff that there was a unlawful search and that it was a, um, a statute 1983, which is the, the, the part of the code um, that is relevant to these, but they might say, hey, that invasion of privacy or that search was unlawful. They may then go on and say that invasion of privacy, the information that you collected, the, the documents you took, whatever pursuant to that unlawful warrant um, was also another violation you might have an easier time, like I said earlier, showing that the uh, improper warrant was a violation and, and that the officers should have known. You might have a more difficult time showing whatever piece of information it was that got out that that invasion of privacy was a constitutional right um, that the police should have been aware of, okay, or, or whomever it is. Um, you run into some really kind of crazy issues with immunity, wherein depending on where you are when it happens, whether you're a foreign national, um, your rights are, are really dependent on that. Uh, for instance, my law class uh, our, this semester, we did an assignment where the board, based on true events and true cases where a border patrol agent sees uh, people playing soccer across the border. Um, he interprets it to be a, uh, a threat to the border and he shoots and he ends up hitting an, um, an innocent bystander who's like a 12 year old girl. Her parents try to, mother tries to bring an action against the, state, the, the government and they say, no, you can't, you can't bring an action. You're not in the United States. He was on American soil. Uh, we don't have jurisdiction for this action. Um, and, and they barred it. Um, what's weird about that is they've also got things like uh, the alien tort statute where, you know, I've got on here on the document 1789, the, the government is basically saying, yeah, if there's a, um, an issue that happens uh, from a foreign national, you can basically bring that claim uh, to recover. Uh, there's a case, I believe it was in the 90s, where um, the DEA, Drug Enforcement Authority, instructed at uh, the Mexican nationals, uh, the, um, their police, to arrest a doctor who they thought was associated with the drug, uh, drug trade. Um, and he was he had to bring his claim under that because there's immunity, sovereign immunity is where all this comes from. Uh, there's the, you know the where you can't sue a government. Um, similarly, we've talked about these incidences where you can't sue because of immunity, and you have to figure out if there's a constitutional right. You have the other issues with immunity where they're saying, hey, you were injured, but it wasn't necessarily a constitutional right. You're not going to be able to bring a 1983 claim, even if you could. There'd be immunity concerns, qualified immunity concerns. Um, however, we're going to carve it out. As I said earlier, there's statutory provisions. We're going to carve one out. One of those being uh, the Tort Claims Act. So, first off, they violated your constitutional rights by having the floor wet. No, so you're going to have a really hard time with immunity defense going at that. At the same time, you don't have any other way to get relief. You don't have any way to be compensated if you're barred from suing them. Um, you know, because of immunity. Well, now you're heard at the post office, you're just supposed to take it. Um, so there's, there's other ways around it. Uh, you know, like I said, the Tort Claims Act um, that go with it. Um, then there becomes the gray issue of whether there's the, the, the clear issue or clear constitutional right. Um, for instance, 
Breonna Taylor asleep in her bed. Um, they execute a warrant. Or I don't know anything specifically about the warrant, except that from my understanding, um, the actual drug dealer they were looking for was you know, many miles away. Um, and there's dispute as to whether they knocked and announced. Um, and when they knock and announce, um, there's a situation of, okay, when we get to that next level of it and we look at Breonna Taylor's uh, being shot, how are we going to show that the officers knew in that situation that when they entered the home, um, and even if they didn't knock and announce, if the person in the home thought it was an intruder and fired back at them, did they know it was improper or a clear constitutional violation for them to shoot back? Um, there are uh, plenty of cases, I believe one of them is Menendez out of California, um, where officers do in fact execute a faulty warrant. They get on the premises, somebody feels threatened, you know, they, they find the guy and I think he was in a shed in the backyard, um, he's asleep, they come in um, and he picks up the gun and tries to shoot back and, and they kill him, he brings an excessive force claim. Um, and, and they said, no, it doesn't matter that the warrants were wrong, it's at the time that basically he pulled the trigger. Um, because they had to say, at the time they had to know was, was it so that's getting into the reasonable but the bottom line is whether the there was a clearly established rule um so uh, trying to get through this and i apologize if i was going too fast with that but one of the things i wanted to bring up and get to specifically was the confusion with uh rights to assemble um and what is a lawful gathering um and, and the the training that is required of the police in that situation okay so um, when you're in a free speech situation, uh, or in a First Amendment situation, which is free speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, um, you're, you're sitting in, you are able to present your arguments, uh, or, or to say whatever your piece is, and they don't look at, the government doesn't look at First Amendment issues and say, oh, freedom of speech is more important than freedom of religion, or, or it's more important than freedom of assembly. They're the same, um, you know, and, and they're treated, in essence, the same. So when we talk about peaceful protests, well, is it unpeaceful if, you, if you're cussing? No, um, generally speaking, no, because they've allowed people to, to cuss, they, it's freedom of speech, but also, you know, I got on here, you've got protests at the um, Iraq and military funerals uh, for veterans of the United States, KKK marches, 99 percenters, all these people that protest, um, whether it's controversial or not, what they're protesting about, um, they're certainly afforded that right. The question is, when you start looking at it, is how does an officer know if they've actually violated somebody's right? In other words, not whether it's an unlawful gathering, but whether they should even know they, they can't be doing that in the first place. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in, because, for instance, w w some of the questions the Supreme Court will ask is, was it peaceful? What does that mean? Was there threats? Was there violence? Was there weapons? Was there movements towards the officer? These are really broad statements. Um, you know, movement towards the officers. Let's think of the 75 year old in Buffalo, right? Um, you know, if we want to go uh, from the side of the defend, uh, the um, the uh, law enforcement and based on the language of the Supreme Court, he is moving at them. So could they have detained him? Um, did they know that there was a clear rule that they couldn't do that? That, that, that they did they had to let him protest and that they couldn't detain him? Maybe that's uh, a gray area. Um, once they get past that, then there's obviously the other test of whether the force is there. Um, so they have to know whether that, and I'm not gonna say much about the excessive force because of our next speaker, but um, there's that next aspect that goes to it. And so each time that you're looking at a constitutional violation, you've got the immunity defense of, does that specific issue, did I know that it would have been a violation? Um, did I know that it was a clear issue? Okay, and, and that's why it's important peaceful protests and what your rights are is, is to make sure you're um, in no way infringing on your own rights, but not, not behaving in such a way that you think you might um, to give them an example, because look at some of the language of this um, clear and present danger of riot and disorder, interference with traffic, police safety, order, or peace from the 1940 Supreme court case. That's basically anything, right? That's just up for interpretation of anything. So in that sense, um, how would they, how would we ever be able to assert that they've, they knew that they were, you know, that they had noticed that they were violating your constitutional rights, right? If they go to disperse your lawful protest because they call it unlawful and they've got these really broad standards before we even get into the test of whether it was a lawful or unlawful standard, uh, 
uh, assembly, it's, it's very difficult to know if the officer would have had any kind of reasonable expectation of knowing that that was a violation, that they shouldn't have done that. Um, there are Supreme Court cases that say, yeah, in that situation, no reasonable officer would have expected, uh, would have thought that it was constitutional to run in there um, and, and attack, you know, some truly peaceful protesters. But, but it's such a gray area. Um, and, and you think about disorderly conduct, all right? The police, generally speaking, and I'll say this for the criminal defense attorneys on here as well, but the police, generally speaking, can't create a situation that causes disorderly conduct. Um, it, they have, you know, they they can't, in essence, escalate the situation and then arrest you for um, disorderly conduct. And so, on on Sunday at Marion Square, I think both sides. Um, I certainly have my own opinion on it, but I think both sides have have a clear argument of saying whether it was lawful or not. Did I lose y'all? No, we hear you now. We hear you now, Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. My screen. Yeah, I'm sorry. My screen went out. Um, but but you know, I think there's arguments as to whether the, you know, the uh, police would have thought that that was an unlawful gathering, and therefore, if they broke it up, that it would have been a violation of some con their constitutional rights. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, I think for most of the protesters in that incident, they were, by all accounts, being. Um, nonviolent, peaceful on Sunday. And I think the worst thing you could say is that they were cussing at the police officers um, before uh, the, the pepper tear gas, whatever it was that was fired. I know there's some confusion about that. Um, and, and so it's one of those situations where it's tough and it's tough for you as a protester because you've got so many burdens in bringing this action. You're just asking them to enforce the rights. You're asking them to honor your rights. Um, and that brings us to a situation of if, they're not honoring your rights. Is it because they don't care and they're disregarding your rights or is it because they're unaware of your rights? So the last one I think say about this is if you're an individual and, and you're a police officer and, and by lack of training or, or just your own um, negligence, you violate somebody's rights. You can't sue, generally speaking, you can't sue that government entity for a failure to train. Um, I know in George Floyd case, uh, I will not speak to any of the merits of what's going on with that investigation, but I will say from what I understand, there was a, uh, a, a, a guy, one of the officers had only been on the force for four days, right? Um, if, if he in fact is charged and is held to have behaved improperly, um, I don't think the Floyd family or anybody else bringing a claim would have a claim that uh, his, the failure to train him was an actual actionable amount unless they could show that the training was so systemic throughout the entire um, police department that they showed an indifference for people's rights. Um, and, and going back to some of the school incidents, that's a, where it roll, rolls down to is that um, the policy training doesn't show, um, you know, an indifference. Um, the last thing I want to say about that is with curfews. Um, I wrote an article to the posting, well, no, I didn't send it to the posting girl, but to the, the mayor and the um, chief of police for Charleston last week because they implemented a uh, curfew uh, for downtown, the peninsula, but not even for the entire city of Charleston. It was really weird. Um, my wife and I live downtown. You know, our law partners live in Mount Pleasant. Um, they were all joking about how they were having a, a cookout that afternoon um, because they were free to travel and we weren't on the peninsula. And so I wrote an article because I, I, or a letter to them because I said I thought it was really tough that on the, that, that Monday they had implemented the 6 p.m. curfew and made the protesters go home, but they had let everyone else uh, free for unmolested travel throughout the city to exercise, to do whatever the heck they wanted. Well, the reason why that's so con concerning to me is because bottom line is a curfew can't be implemented unless there's a real threat, and it can't just be the mere possibility of a threat. It's got to be a real threat, and uh, from my perspective, they uh, were kind of, even from Mayor Tecklenburg's statement, said that they were just in anticipation of one, um, and so I think the problem with that is it's hard for you to know um, what you can do to protect yourself if the officials in charge aren't uh, very clear on what the law is themselves, much less necessarily implementing it accurately, because not only do you have to show um, that their behavior was reasonable, even before you get, to, or unreasonable, even before you get to that test, as far as your violation, you're going to have to show that they knew it was a violation. And I think that becomes very difficult for things like curfew and lawful protest um, 
where there's so much uncertainty with it. Um, I apologize for rambling so much. No, I think you're fine. Um, and I guess I want to draw a connection between George Floyd and what you just talked about, qualified immunity. So if the family, for example, wanted to enact an action, how difficult or how easy would that be uh, for them to achieve that successfully? Well, I, I think that, I, I think in, in that situation, and, and I'm by no means, I, I think the, our next speaker would, would probably be more accurate for that. But as far as the immunity concerns, I think it's going to be a much less, um, as an attorney, I should never say that. I'm optimistic that I think it'll be a lower burden in the sense that I don't think any truly objective person could sit in that situation and say that behavior was reasonable, okay? We, we give a lot of deference to the police, but I think as far as, I'll give you a hypothetical for when I think that it might've been um, you know, a, a more difficult task as far as that initial immunity burden, Tola, would be if they were in a situation where that police officer is the only one in sight and there's no one else in sight and people are saying, can you release Mr. Floyd? He says he can't breathe and he says, hey, I understand that. I, I respect him, but at the same time, there's a whole bunch of y'all I'm the only one here and, and I have a reasonable fear for my life or something like that. I think then in a situation, it would be a lot more difficult for them to say he clearly knew he was violating somebody's rights because an officer does have a right to take reasonable efforts to protect themselves while they're out there doing their task, right? And that goes towards the whole reason for immunity. So I think in that situation, they would have a better argument as far as, oh, he was just doing his job and he was acting reasonably. I think in this situation with you know, three or four cops standing around and for the amount of time, and that it didn't seem like there was, from the footage I saw, and that's all I saw, doesn't seem like there's any um, real threat to the officer that would necessitate something like that. So I think in that situation, it's just, hey, does an objective officer think that that's reasonable in that situation? Before we even test if it was excessive force or not, does, a, uh, does an objective officer think that, that they were reasonably inflicting on somebody's constitutional rights by behaving that way? I think that's a hard argument. For them. Scott, um... You know, you shed such great light on, on qualified immunity. I mean, I learned so much just from that. I mean, we've been discussing with the board, um, you know, all these issues. A lot of organizations are, are asking for an end to qualified immunity. Um, how would that play out in, in real life if that was a policy that was adopted? You know, I don't know because, I, and, and I'll tell you this, to me, a lot of these rules um, it's similar to immunity, but, but, but just deference to police officers and, and other officials in general. It's kind of the old adage of a tie goes to the runner in baseball, right? And if they get to the base at the first time, the ball and the runner, the runner is safe, right? Well, I think uh, based on the job requirements, I think rightfully so in the original, um, you know, when this originally all started with law enforcement and everything else, there was a deference to the police officers um, in that if there was a tie, we were going to, to lean to them because they were the presumably more trained in that situation, more prepared to deal with that. That was their profession. Um, you know, an attorney comes to our office and says, hey, here's my opinion, but I'm going to defer to you to, to kind of point me in the right direction. And, and I think that that um, was how it you know, originated. And I think we've gotten to a situation where, in my eyes, the, the balance of deference has gotten really a far out of whack, particularly in light of the efforts that are made to ensure um, that the training and policies are in place um, to mitigate those instances of uh, abuse of discretion. Um, because well, I think it puts, puts them in a bad, bad spot. Scott, thank you so much for um, sharing that information and those slides were really helpful. Um, I'm going to go now to Professor Stout. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, Professor, you also, um, you know, are, are a law professor. You have students who teach classes. Um, you also, you know, write about these issues specifically regarding police. Um, but you also have a background in law enforcement. Can you just tell us about that? I do. Yeah, I spent five years as a city cop in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, a little under five years as a full-time officer. And then when I left that job for a position as a state investigator, I stayed on as a reservist for another six months. So I was a, then a state investigator for more than two and a half years before going to law school. And uh, ultimately, 
um, going down the, the academic route that I am now, where I've been studying policing from an academic perspective for the last eight years. Can you explain um, for people that maybe, I mean, we, you know, Tola and I are attorneys, we're all attorneys here, but what is use of force? Like, what does that mean um, in the police setting? Yeah, well, one of the really confusing things is like a lot of things, it has different meanings in different contexts. So we can divide, uh, we can look at use of force in a couple of different ways. Whenever there's a use of force incident, we can analyze it in a couple of different ways. First, we can say, did it violate the Constitution? Did it violate the Fourth Amendment? Second, we can say, did it violate state law? Third, we can say, did it violate the agency's administrative policies, training procedures, regulations, and the like? And then separate from all of those, we can ask, is it what the community expected? Did it violate community expectations? The difficult part about defining use of force is every one of those categories has a slightly different definition, where casually we'll use the phrase use of force, but it may or may not count as a use of force, for example, for constitutional law. So let me explain what I mean. The Fourth Amendment protects the individual right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. And the Supreme Court has defined a seizure to uh, generally include what we would consider to be a use of force. If an officer makes physical contact with someone with the intention of limiting their movement, it's a seizure. But although that sounds like it's going to be a use of force, if an officer shoots at someone but misses and the person's running away, that's not a seizure, even though it is a use of force. So the Fourth Amendment, we're not actually asking about uses of force. We're really asking about seizures. State law is very similar. State law doesn't really define use of force. State law allows officers to use force, but it doesn't do a great job of defining exactly what that is, except possibly in some states when it defines deadly force to have a particular meeting. What state law is typically referring to, instead of the narrow concept of seizures, what state law is typically referring to is physical violence grabbing, punching, kicking, dragging to the ground, kneeling on top of someone, shooting, tasing, pepper spraying, the whole line. So for state law purposes, we can think that violent actions are a use of force. For agency policies, they may actually define use of force more broadly and more narrowly. Many use of force policies at individual police agencies, because every agency can have its own policy, many of those policies define a use of force or they start what's called, what they call their force matrix or their force continuum, which is a spectrum of different types of force at an officer's presence. So just merely being present on scene is in some context a use of force really may be better termed a use of authority, but in the policing context, it may be referred to as a use of force. At the same time, though, agencies may uh, limit what they count as a use of force by not requiring officers to report certain things that do count as physical violence. There are agencies, for example, that do not require officers to fill out any sort of separate report or to independently document when they bring someone to the ground, when they drive someone to the ground. So you can see the potential definitional problems. And by the way, for any attorneys who are, who are listening here, right, including the folks uh, I can see, it's all about how we define words, right? Community expectations uh, can take a very broad version of use of force or of, of violence. So whew, there's a lot there in how we define use of force and the different meanings that that phrase can have in the different contexts that we're talking about. Uh, do you want me to keep going? Do you have questions? How do you how do you want me? I I can just keep riffing if you want, but I want to know if uh, if there's more targeted discussion that I should be getting out there. No, I think this is this is really helpful, um, Seth. I I guess you know if we can you know use that um, you know in context that people are seeing you know now when it comes to you know protesters and or when it comes to George Floyd. Um, obviously a seizure or touching someone 
contact with a, a citizen would be considered a use of force, even if it's not necessarily violent, right? Just touching that person alone would be a use of force. Is that right? Well, it has to be touching uh, in a way that the reasonable person would anticipate as a signal that they should not leave. Uh, it has to be a, 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 a physical, just patting someone on the back, for example, or shaking someone's hand is not going to be enough to establish a seizure. Uh, but taking someone by the arm, even gently, in circumstances where the reasonable person would not feel free to leave would be a seizure. Physical contact with the intent, the officer's intent to physically restrain, that is a seizure. Um, so I, maybe it would be helpful if I laid out at least very briefly the Fourth Amendment rules and then the state law rules, particularly here in South Carolina, because that's what our, our focus is on. Uh, the Fourth Amendment protects against the right uh, or protects against unreasonable seizures. And what the Supreme Court has said, in essence, is that an officer's use of force must be reasonable. That is the objective, reasonable officer on the scene, uh, which is kind of a, a legal construct. It's not really a, a real person. It's just the idea that the, the reasonable officer on the scene uh, would think that whatever force was actually used was permissible, was reasonable. So how do we begin to figure out when that's reasonable? The Supreme Court has given us a little bit of guidance, first in the relevant facts and circumstances that we're supposed to look at. The, the court has said, the Supreme Court has said that we rely on the facts as they appeared to the officer on the scene. And that means that officers are entitled to make reasonable mistakes. For example, if an officer sees someone who has a hard, shiny object in their hand and they're making stabbing motions with it, the officer might think that's a knife and use force. And when the court ultimately reviews that use of force, if it was reasonable for the officer to think that it was a knife, then the court will treat it as if it was a knife, even if it turned out to be a harmless plastic toy or something like that. So we look at the facts and circumstances as they appeared to a reasonable officer on the scene. And then we say, okay, given those facts and circumstances, did the officer act reasonably? Well, how do we figure that out? The court's given us, uh, in a case called Graham v. Connor, uh, a, a series of factors that are often referred to as the Graham factors. We look at the severity of the crime. We look at whether the subject was actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest through flight. And we look at whether the subject presented a threat to the officer or others. These factors are, at least in my view, really bad way to evaluate police uses of force. At best, they can be kind of unhelpful because they're really just binary. They're yes, no questions, uh, with the exception of the severity of the crime. For example, did the subject present a threat to the officers? Sure. How much of a threat? Well, the Graham factors don't really help us figure out how to address that. Or uh, what type of threat, not just uh, uh, how severe was the probability of threat, but what's the type of threat that the subject presented? The Graham factors don't really guide us to uh, any degree uh, on how to use that. Even when the Graham factors aren't particularly useful, or, or excuse me, I shouldn't say it that way. Um, some of the Graham factors aren't particularly useful in some circumstances, and sometimes they're actually misleading. Uh, severity of the crime is, is one example. If a subject has committed a, a particularly heinous multiple homicide, but is standing there, giving up with his arms out, gets on the ground when he's told to do so, and is not resisting at all, then there's no justification for the use of force, regardless of how severe that underlying crime was. On the other hand, if a subject is being lawfully arrested for a relatively minor crime, and we can have a separate conversation about it's, whether it's appropriate to uh, arrest someone for fairly minor crimes, but if a subject is being lawfully arrested on a fairly, fairly minor crime and they're resisting, then the officers are going to be reasonable if they use force to address that resistance, even though the crime wasn't terribly severe. So we have the Graham factors, but they're not particularly useful 
ways of evaluating police uses of force. Uh, some courts have recognized that to some extent, others have not. We also have a difference in how courts approach this situation and whether they take a very narrow approach to framing the situation or whether they take a broader approach. So uh, Scott was mentioning earlier that sometimes courts just look at the moment that a trigger was pulled. They, they ask uh, whether in the, in the second or the seconds immediately before an officer pulled a trigger, did the situation justify deadly force? Other circuits though, take a broader view they look at the situation a little more comprehensively and they say, well, did the officer's tactics contribute to the ultimate necessity to use force? This is referred to as the difference between the final frame analysis and a more comprehensive totality of the circumstances analysis. All right, so the ultimate question in the Fourth Amendment context is whether uh, an officer's actions were objectively reasonable and that's not really something that we have well-developed rules on it's going to vary significantly from case to case. And the Supreme Court particularly, and many of the lower courts have been very reluctant to lay out more precise rules because of the wide degree of variability uh, in the operational environment that police actually use force in. There are a couple of examples where we do have more precise rules. The Fourth Circuit, in a case called Armstrong v. Village of Pinehurst, for example, held that officers could only use uh, tasers, when they're defending themselves from a threat of physical harm, they can't use it just to take a, a non-compliant subject into custody, for example. But by and large, uh, following the Supreme Court's instruction, courts don't have a well-developed set of rules for use of force. Instead, we have to, as the Supreme Court put it in a uh, case called Scott v. Harris, slosh our way through a fact-bound morass. How about state law? Because if we don't have really clear rules on constitutional law, maybe we have clearer rules on state law. Here, of course, it depends on what state we're talking about. There are 50 states and all of them have laws re regarding uh, police use of force. Really interestingly, only 42 of them have statutes on use of force. There are 42 states that have statutes regarding deadly force. There are 36 or 37 states that have statutes for uh, less lethal force. And there are different standards in the different states. In fact, in uh, my Evaluating Police Uses of Force book, we have an entire chapter just on the different state law standards here. Well, what about here in South Carolina? We are one of very few states that do not have statutes that regulate police uses of force. We do it through what's called common law, judicial decisions. In a case called State v. Weaver, decided by the state Supreme Court in 1975, the court uh, wrote, the, the state Supreme Court wrote, when an officer has a right to make an arrest, he may use whatever force is reasonably necessary to apprehend the offender or affect the arrest. So, kind of like the Fourth Amendment standard, we see this idea of reasonable necessity, or at least reasonable force. Most states divide between less lethal force, that is force that is possibly but unlikely to cause death or great bodily harm, and deadly force, which is force that is likely to cause death or great bodily harm or serious bodily injury. South Carolina has judicial opinions that do that as well. So State v. Weaver deals with force generally, less lethal force, and a case called uh, Shepard v. State decided in 2004 sets out the rules for deadly force. But the rules for deadly force in South Carolina are really confusing. And it's because the state Supreme Court case, Shepard v. State, quoted or, or uh, cited a Supreme Court case, but described it incorrectly. The Supreme Court case is called Tennessee v. Garner. And in Tennessee v. Garner, the Supreme Court held that an officer can only use deadly force when they have probable cause to believe that the subject presents an immediate threat of death or great bodily harm to the officer or others. That's become kind of a standard rule. And in the years after the 1985 decision of Tennessee v. Garner, most states have adopted that or something like that into their state laws. In 2004, South Carolina decided, the South Carolina Supreme Court decided this case called Shepard v. State, and they cited Tennessee v. Garner. They said, uh, 
that or they appeared to suggest that the state would adopt the rule in Tennessee v. Garner, but this is the way they described it. Quote, an officer may use whatever force is necessary to affect the arrest of a felon, including deadly force to affect that arrest. And they cited to Tennessee Garner, but that's not what Tennessee Garner, uh, Tennessee versus Garner says. In fact, Tennessee v. Garner says exactly the opposite. Tennessee v. Garner rejected that rule. So unfortunately, the state of, uh, if you'll forgive the unintentional pun, the state of state law uh, regarding police uses of deadly force in South Carolina is really kind of confused right now. And that doesn't even begin to get into the agency standards. We have more than 270 different police agencies in South Carolina, and all of them are free to adopt slightly or very different approaches to how they regulate uses of force. Some may allow officers to use pepper spray in some circumstances, while other agencies wouldn't allow officers to use pepper spray under those circumstances, for example. So there can be a wide degree of variability. I want to uh, pause and answer any questions that have come up here. So we have some through Facebook that have come in. Uh, one question uh, it states, as someone who has been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, I don't understand how use of force is so strict in the military and overseas, however, <laughs> use of force is so safe <laughs> and can have Americans killed with little repercussion. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, um, that, that's, that's a wonderful comment and I appreciate it. And let me first say that I am not an expert in uh, the military. So I, I encourage uh, that, that viewer to help me out here. Uh, in the military context, there are typically something called rules of engagement. And there are different uh, types of rules of engagement that can apply in different theaters and different um, circumstances. Um, we don't have that in the United States. We don't have anything as binding on officers as the rules of engagement are on uh, the military. Um, and in my view, that has been uh, a problem. On the one hand, we do want officers to have a degree of flexibility that they need, that they very often need to uh, react appropriately under a particular set of circumstances. On the other hand, well, let me do this. Um, uh, Tola, I, I, I want to play a game with you. You want to play a game real quick? Absolutely. Okay. So before we play the game, you're going to need to know the rules, right? Of course. Just be objectively reasonable. Okay. How, how do we play the game? We have no idea, right? Because while be objectively reasonable is maybe useful as, a, as an analytical exercise, it doesn't provide any meaningful guidance to officers on what force they're allowed to use and when they're, excuse me, and when they're allowed to use it, let alone how they're allowed to use it. And this is a real issue because officers, particularly in South Carolina, do not get nearly the amount of training that they need. So having clearer legal guidelines could help a lot as officers operate in, uh, what can, uh, under the Supreme Court's uh, recitation, be circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. There, you usually want some degree of certainty or rules that you can turn to and, and rely on, and we just don't have that in the policing context. Now, this might be too reductive um, in terms of comparing the two situations, but it seems like the, the rules enacted upon the military allow for better treatment internationally than we ask for domestically. Um, are we ask? is it too much to ask for more stringent requirements for our officers? Is it unduly burdensome? Um, so that is definitely a matter of opinion. I would generally argue no. I would generally argue that we can do a lot more to provide meaningful guidance to officers about when and how they're to use different force options. Uh, we haven't done that, and that's, uh, uh, I mean, there are probably, uh, there are a, a number of reasons for that. Um, but no, and, and we can use the case uh, Armstrong v. Village of Pinehurst as an example, right? Uh, it did set a clear rule. Now, you can argue that the rule on taser use in that case is uh, appropriate or inappropriate, but it did provide some pretty clear guidance. Officers can use tasers when they are being physically threatened not just when they're trying to take someone into custody who does not present a physical threat to them. And to help explain that a little bit, it can be useful to think about uh, police uses of force as 
falling into one of two categories. On the one hand, we can have defensive force, officers who are using force to protect themselves or another person from physical harm. Anything that's not a use of defensive force, we might call an assertive use of force. If someone is running away from trying to escape being arrested, an officer tackles them, that's an assertive use of force. It's not to protect the officer or other people, at least not in my hypothetical. It's just to apprehend that person. So if we used that type of approach, we can say that the rule in Armstrong said that tasers can be used defensively, but not assertively. I don't think it's too much to expect officers to know and act under a set of rules like that. Although I certainly acknowledge that there is room for reasonable debate on whether, for example, uh, we should allow some taser use assertively and not just restricted to defensively. If, does that make sense? It does. Uh, Scott, what's your take? Yeah, so I just wanted to ask you, going back, you know, talking about the debate between the totality of the circumstances at the moment, um, all of that, I was curious, um, you know, I said we did this in the spring, so I know, it, you know, from an academic level more than any kind of practical sense of litigation, but um, one of the things we ran into was the Mesa Hernandez case, as I was talking about with the Border Patrol. Um, yeah. You know, with the 1983, talking about the split second, um, or at the moment, totality, whatever, they've made it clear that intent, motive, bias is completely irrelevant for that determination. Um, 242, which is when the government is suing, uh, you know, a law enforcement officer or other official uh, for a constitutional violation, is in essence the same test, except it adds um, a requirement of intent. And yeah. I'm curious if you think that we might be in a better place if we drifted towards adding some level of intent into the 1983 excessive force because of all the carve outs they've made, for instance, you know, if there's just a victim in the cop and they're trying to determine what actually happened, they're extending it because they're saying, okay, well, then you can bring intent to try to help uh, understand why somebody might be motivated to misrepresent, you know, all those kind of things. The courts have already, in essence, brought in all this intent and bias motive type evidence. Do you think we, it might help make it a clearer test for the officers and for uh, civilians to know when force could be used? Yeah, yeah, there, and there are a couple of different things there. Um, so, uh, 42 USC United States Code Section 1983 is a statute that, uh, and I, I, I know you guys already know this, but this just to explain it to viewers, it's a statute that allows private individuals, you and me, to sue a government official who, while acting under color of law in a, a, an official capacity, we'll just simplify it and say in an official capacity, violates your constitutional rights. So if an officer uses excessive force, the idea is they violated your Fourth Amendment right to be free from an unreasonable seizure, and you bring a 1983 claim saying they violated my Fourth Amendment rights. 18 U.S.C. Section 242 is a criminal statute. It allows the Department of Justice to prosecute an officer who violates someone's constitutional rights while acting under color of law, but only if the officer did that willfully. And what the Supreme Court has interpreted that word willfully to mean is with intent, and particularly with something that lawyers call specific intent. It doesn't quite require the officer to know that he's violating a constitutional right, to have the purpose of violating a constitutional right, but it does require more than just general confusion or good faith on the officer's part. Now, part of what complicates all of this, we have to back up to the Fourth Amendment and that idea of unreasonable seizures, because in the Fourth Amendment context, the Supreme Court has generally held, with very few exceptions, that an officer's subjective intentions don't matter. For Fourth Amendment purposes, the only thing that we care about is whether the officer acted reasonably, whether they had the uh, legal authority to do what they did. So for example, um, if someone were to say, uh, that officer only arrested me because I am uh, a minority or I'm a woman or something like that, and that violated my Fourth Amendment rights, the court would say, it doesn't matter why the officer arrested you. We don't care about their subjective motivation. The only thing we care about is whether the officer had probable cause to make the arrest. That claim that an officer arrested you for being a, a minority 
you could bring a different type of claim. You could bring what's called an equal protection challenge, but in the Fourth Amendment, it doesn't matter. So, okay, how does this play out in the use of force context? It doesn't matter whether an officer is using force because they hate someone or because they're a racist or because they uh, are just having a bad day and want to take it out on someone and this victim happens to be nearby. The only thing that matters for Fourth Amendment purposes is whether the officer's actions objectively were reasonable. I have some concerns about taking the willful uh, component of 242 and bringing it into 1983 because of the way that that idea of willfulness gets layered on top of the Fourth Amendment, which doesn't care uh, in, in most circumstances, with a couple of exceptions, which doesn't care about uh, um, uh, an officer's subjective intent. The other thing about Section 242 is it can be really difficult for the government to prove willfulness. Um, it is a very high bar. Now, it wouldn't be quite as high a bar in the 1983 context, because in the Section 242 context, we're talking about a criminal prosecution. That means the government has to prove willfulness beyond a reasonable doubt. In the 1983 context, we're talking about a civil claim, and the, what's called the standard of proof is lower. That means the government, or excuse me, the plaintiff uh, would just have to establish that the officer's actions were willful uh, um, by a preponderance of the evidence rather than by uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. So I, I think there's an argument there, but I, I think it would um, confuse what is already, unfortunately, a very confusing area of law. Um, Seth, let me, let me try and see if I can get this together here. So South Carolina does not have any laws, any statutes that regulate use of force. Other states do, right? Co that's so correct. We do not have any laws that the legislator passed that are on the books in South Carolina. So because there's no laws, what happens is we have to go by whatever the judges or the Supreme Court of South Carolina or other higher justices have ruled upon. That's how we how it works when it comes to the law. If there's not one on the books, then we look to the case law, we say, what the justices have written in opinions. So that's correct. Because we have no laws about it, we're looking at um, Graham, the Graham case. That was a US Supreme Court case, right? Was that US? Uh, it, yeah, so in, in South Carolina, we haven't had a state. A, a state Supreme Court case that looked at Graham, but we have had one that looked at another uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, which is Tennessee v. Garner. Yes. So, and, and under that Graham case, the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court case, to determine whether use of force, I'm assuming, is acceptable, there's three um, factors, right? whether well first whether that person was whether the officer was acting as a reasonable officer at the time that they used the the force and then that also is the whether, ultimate question whether they were a risk of flight there how what the seriousness of that crime was and whether that person was a threat to that officer or anybody else around right that's so correct that's, that's really what we're looking at in south carolina but the state South Carolina has talked specifically about um, when to use less than lethal force. So like a taser, for example, is that right? Under State so, v. Weaver or was that a U.S. Supreme Court? Uh, no, State v. Weaver is a, is a South Carolina case and it just says that officers can use reasonably necessary force uh, without really defining other than in the context of making an arrest, uh, without really defining when officers can use res reasonably necessary force or what reasonably necessary force means. Right. And then when it comes to lethal force, um, it's, you know, your understanding as you're explaining that you believe that the state um, Supreme Court may have misinterpreted another court's decision in saying that deadly force is acceptable when there's probable cause that the subject or the person that they're using it on has um, threatened death or great bodily harm against the officers or others. Is that right? It, it, it's close, yeah. So uh, the, the South Carolina Supreme Court said that uh, officers can use deadly force uh, 
uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that slightly. The South Carolina Supreme Court have said, uh, and I, I will quote from Shepard v. State, an officer may use whatever force is necessary to affect the arrest of a felon, including deadly force to affect that arrest. But it cited the South Carolina Supreme Court made that statement and then said, see this other case, which was Tennessee v. Garner. And what makes that so confusing is that's not what Tennessee versus Garner said. What Tennessee versus Garner said was that officers cannot use lethal force to prevent the escape of a fleeing felon. Instead, they could only use lethal force when they have probable cause to believe that the subject presents an immediate threat of death or great bodily harm. Okay. So because the Supreme Court of South Carolina said one thing, but cited a case that stands for something entirely different, it leaves the law on deadly force in South Carolina kind of up in the air. We don't really know. Uh, and, and maybe most embarrassingly, we don't have the legislature weighing in to say this is when officers can use deadly force. Seth, and has there been any legislation effort? I'm sorry. No, um, I'm not sure if there have been legislative efforts. I can tell you nothing's nothing's passed, um, but I, I don't I don't I am not aware of any uh, recent legislative efforts. I, I haven't looked back too far historically to, to to check though. So Seth, you know, one of our viewers uh, made a statement, a question, saying that it sounds like South Carolina case law states that now police officers can murder or use lethal force against someone that's being arrested for a felony? Uh, that is what State v. Shepard appears to say, if you take it at its face, yes, that they can use any amount of force, including deadly force, just to arrest a felon. And to, be, to, to dive into that just a little bit, um, prior to 1985, most states did allow usually as a matter of statute, but sometimes as a matter of common law, that judge-made law that you were talking about, Ali, uh, most states did allow officers to use deadly force to prevent the escape of a, of a, fle a felon. Uh, this was referred to as the fleeing felon rule. And it's a very old rule. It predates the United States. It was the common law of England that we incorporated into the colonies and later the early states. Um, but in that 1985 case of Tennessee versus Garner, the court said, well, wait a second, times have changed. Things are different. Because when that common law rule was developed, officers didn't carry guns. They carried batons. And that meant that for an officer to use deadly force, they had to be engaged in melee combat. They had to be right up on somebody, which meant that the officer themselves were, was also uh, being threatened. Today, that's not the case because officers carry firearms. And in fact, in the case of Tennessee v. Garner, an officer responded to a report of a burglary at a house, uh, saw a, a kid who he identified as a kid come out of the house, and the kid, uh, Garner, uh, began to, Edward Garner, began to climb a fence, and the officer thought to himself, well, uh, I don't think the kid's armed. I know he's a kid. But if I don't use deadly force, this felon, because burglary is a felony, this felon's going to get away. So he shot and killed him. That was perfectly legal at the time under a Tennessee law that authorized officers to use deadly force to stop fleeing felons. And the Supreme Court said that violates the Fourth Amendment. You can't do that. Instead, you can only use deadly force when there's probable cause to believe that the subject presents an immediate threat of death or great bodily harm. So Seth, you talk about, you know, you, you discussed South Carolina and that we don't have laws right now that are regulating use of force, whether it's, you know, um, not less than lethal force or lethal force or any type of force, but there are states that do have laws on the books. Is that right? Yeah, most states have statutes that regulate police uses of force. And, and I, I want to clarify just very quickly, we do have statutes that relate to the use of force, but not the use of force by police. So uh, South Carolina Code Section 17-13-20 uh, lays out when community members, when you or I can use deadly force. Uh, 
uh, including some very problematic circumstances that we probably don't have to get into right now. So we do have laws on the books. The legislature is perfectly capable of developing these rules. We just haven't done it for police uses of deadly force. Question, Alan? Okay. Most states have. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I don't want to use hyperbole, but in, in essence, it sounds like to me, I mean, this is very disturbing because I haven't heard it uh, prior to tonight. But it sounds to me if there's a bench warrant issued for a felon that in South Carolina, it is a wanted dead or alive poster. <laughs> is that, is, I mean, is that, am I exaggerating that? You know, I, I haven't thought about it in those terms, but if the Supreme Court, uh, if the courts interpret State v. Shepard, that, that state Supreme Court case, uh, the way its language certainly suggests, um, yeah, it, it might be a little bit hyperbolic, but it's not too far from the truth. If, if there's a felon, uh, then officers can use any amount of force, including deadly force, to arrest the felon. Even if that felony is for uh, a nonviolent crime, uh, even if that felony is sort of barely a felony, right? A dollar over the grand theft threshold, for example. Uh, and by the way, if I can go back for a second to Tennessee v. Garner, another reason that the Supreme Court said that, it, that the fleeing felon rule was not appropriate anymore was because what we have considered to be felonies have changed a lot. Originally at common law, there were only a little more than half a dozen felonies uh, murder, maiming, uh, uh, burglary, um, robbery, rape. Uh, there were a couple of others. Today, we have lots and lots and lots of felonies. So when you consider how much the concept of felony has expanded, the Supreme Court said it just doesn't make sense to allow officers to use deadly force to arrest every felon. And as the Supreme Court said, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, I realize I keep going back between the Supreme Court of South Carolina and the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, as the Supreme Court of the United States said, and I think this is a good public policy point, it is not better that all felons die, uh, excuse me, it is, it is not better that all felons die than that they escape. Sometimes if we value the sanctity of human life, we say, okay, the criminal got away this time, We'll catch them later. We don't need to shoot them in the back of the head as they flee. So I want to ask a question of my own that's slightly convoluted. Um, earlier this year, the Supreme Court came out with State v. Spears, and uh, yeah. Justice Beatty gave a powerful dissent um, in terms of the experience, uh, the lived experience of a Black individual and their interactions with police. And earlier we talked about how generally jurisprudence doesn't really care about race in terms of evaluating a situation. How do you feel that like that ties in with use of force? Um, what's actual probable cause or reasonable suspicion uh, and the like? Yeah, um, so State v. Spears, uh, okay. So if we go back to the Fourth Amendment, this idea of a seizure, someone is seized when a, uh, I'm going to get a little bit into the into the nitty gritty here. So you're getting a, a piece of my criminal procedure class uh, for for the cost of nothing. Um, an individual is seized for purposes of the Fourth Amendment when a reasonable person in that position would not feel free to leave. And there are two circumstances when that can be the case. One, when the officer uh, displays a, a a show of authority that's intended to limit someone's movement and the person actually stops. Uh, like an officer activates their overhead lights to initiate a traffic stop, someone looks in the rearview mirror and pulls over to the side of the road. They are submitting to that show of authority that's designed to limit their movement, right? The other way that someone can be stopped is what we were talking about before. Someone can be seized is what we were talking about before and that's the physical contact with the intent to restrain. If we think about the reasonable person, State B. Spears, and particularly the dissent in State B. Spears, uh, essentially addresses this question of, is there a difference between the reasonable black person and the reasonable white person? 
That is, might there be circumstances where a person of color would not feel free to leave, would not feel free to disregard the police and go about their business, and thus they would be seized when in the same situation, a reasonable white person would feel free to leave, would feel free to disregard the police and go about their business, in which case they would not be seized. And as you know, what the state Supreme Court said is uh, essentially we're, we're not going to answer that. We're not going to engage with that. We're not going to adopt that approach. And uh, Justice Beatty said, well, wait a second. There are definitely situations, interactions with the police, where a reasonable black person would think it is not, I am not free to leave. And if I try to leave, bad things are going to happen to me. I'm obviously oversimplifying his dissent, and it's a very, very powerful dissent that I strongly recommend everyone read. Uh, you can find it on the, on the Supreme Court website under, if you search for State v. Spears. Um, the tension between the majority's case, the, the majority opinion and uh, the dissent in State v. Spears is one that is right under the surface of a lot of United States Supreme Court opinions dealing with Fourth Amendment issues, not just the use of force, but also the use of force. Uh, Edward Garner was black, although the court really didn't make an issue of that in Tennessee v. Garner. DeThorne Graham, who was the individual stopped for the case Graham v. Connor, which sets out the rules for uh, less lethal force, was black, although the court really didn't make an issue of that in its opinion. The Supreme Court has tended to take what we might call a colorblind approach, where it really does not acknowledge the role or impact of race in most cases. There have been a couple of small hints here and there, but the courts never really squarely engaged with the fact that people of color perceive the police and the social dynamics of a police interaction differently. The courts also never really engaged with the idea that the police might see people of color and the social situation differently than they would see a, a non-minority individual with whom they're interacting. So I, I, I'm not sure that fully answers your question, and it certainly isn't satisfying, at least it isn't satisfying to me. Um, but race tends to be, at best, in the Supreme Court jurisprudence, an undercurrent and not something that is explicitly uh, acknowledged to the extent that it probably should be. Thank you. Um, and I also have a question from somebody who's watching. Uh, the, it states, what are some good model statutes on excessive force we could use to draft a proposed statute for SC? Any states that have statutes that have been studied? Uh, yes, this is a great question, and I'm going to give you uh, a slightly complicated answer followed by what I hope is a very simple answer. Um, the slightly complicated answer is we really don't have a great sense about how much the statutory text uh, matters, and let me explain what I mean by that. Um, Tennessee has a very restrictive deadly force law. Tennessee is one of just a few states that says that officers can only use deadly force after all other reasonable means of apprehension have been exhausted. That means that if officers can try, if it's reasonable to try something other than deadly force, they should, right? In fact, they have to before they can use deadly force. Florida has a very permissive deadly force law. It's one of the five states that still has a fleeing felon law on the books that allows uh, officers to use deadly force to stop fleeing felons, okay? But when we look per capita at the number of lethal police shootings in Tennessee and the number of lethal police shootings in Florida, the per capita numbers are neck and neck. So does the statute do any good? Well, maybe. It's really difficult to tell without significantly more study than anyone's managed to do. Florida provides uh, more minimum training to officers than Tennessee does. There are other factors that might drive down use of force in Florida uh, as opposed to Tennessee. It might be that if Tennessee didn't have that statute, its use of force would be much higher. We don't know. That's a counterfactual, and it, it's not it's not clear, right? All of which, and I don't want to sound discouraging, uh, because what we do know, for what this is worth, what we do know is 
the different ways that states approach things do matter a lot. It's just that I can't really quantify how much or always. And we know that state differences matter a lot because New York has uh, the, the fewest number of police, uh, of lethal police shootings per capita, despite being a very large state, as one of the, the fewest, uh, it has the fewest lethal police shootings per capita in the country. New Mexico has literally 10 times as many lethal police shootings per capita as New York does. Hmm. So clearly, differences between states matter a lot. And also clearly, the state statutes or the state law play some role, but it's difficult to identify exactly how much of a role that is. Okay, so uh, now to answer the actual question, do we have a good model? Yes, we do have a couple of good models. Um, the best one, in my opinion, is California, which just amended uh, two statutes last year with a, with a bill that uh, was Assembly Bill 392 in California. Uh, California had the two oldest unamended use of force statutes in the country. One enacted in 1872, the other in uh, the 1950s, I believe. Uh, and it was only last year that they turned around and, and amended those. Um, also, I suppose for purposes of full disclosure, I will tell you that I helped work on the, the legislation in California, so I'm intimately familiar with it. It adopted a much, it, California used to be a fleeing felon state. It adopted a much stricter standard for use of force. It did far more than any other state in the country to define things like imminent threat. Officers can use deadly force against an imminent threat of death or great bodily harm, but how do we know when a threat is imminent? California statute drew on not just legal principles, but also principles from within policing itself to define what imminent threat means so that officers can't just use deadly force if they have speculative fears that someone might be a threat. They have to articulate uh, a, a little more precisely. Uh, California's law emphasizes tactics and the role of police in avoiding the type of uh, avoidable uses of force that Scott was talking about with the, the gentleman who was sleeping in the, in the shed in the backyard uh, who grabbed a gun when the police burst in unexpectedly, right? Uh, so I think California is a, is a good statute that's worth taking a hard look at. Uh, Washington State did something very similar. There was de-escalation requirements. Uh, there were additional training requirements in both California's law and Washington State's law. Uh, and both of those are, are worth learning from. I will also say, though, that just having the statute on the books isn't going to be enough. We need broader and deeper changes. It's like at a police agency, just changing the policy isn't going to be enough unless you're also holding officers accountable when they're violating that policy, which requires supervisors to pay attention, to be attuned to those potential policy violations. So um, South Carolina, for example, has uh, systematically underinvested in our public safety infrastructure. Not just have we failed to provide resources for uh, mental health and homelessness and poverty and other purely social service uh, aspects of what police sometimes have to deal with, but we've also underinvested in police training. The national average across the country for academy training is 21 to 24 weeks. That's the average. South Carolina is uh, one of the worst in the nation. We require 12 weeks of training. And of that 12 weeks, only eight of them are in person. Four of them are online. And that's even before the, the coronavirus situation. So while I certainly think that there are statutes in other states that we could look at, and there are, uh, it's not just California, there are other states that have individual provisions that are really good and that are worth incorporating. Uh, we also need to think beyond just passing a statutory law uh, as we try to get a, a handle on the potential for m police to misuse their authority. Seth, um, you know, some of our, our viewers are asking, you know, that they're not lawyers, that they're not politicians. What can they do to change these things? Um, how does that work? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, police reform generally is, uh, uh, well, let me rephrase that slightly. The 
failure to get the police reform that the country needs is not a lack of knowledge. So we know what to do. We've broadly known what to do for a long time. The failure is one of political will. We haven't had elected officials who have felt the need to make the changes that need to be made. And that's where you and I come in. We should be demanding that our elected officials at the federal level, but also at the state and local level, are proactive about police reform. There's a lot that policing does right, but there's a lot that can stand to be improved. And maybe most importantly for talking about this, this as a political issue, police reform really shouldn't be seen as bipartisan. When we're talking about uh, use of force and improving community member safety, safety isn't a zero sum game. It's not the case that improving a community member safety is going to reduce an officer's safety. It is very often the case, particularly with statutes or other reforms that are aimed at better tactics, that both officers and community members will be made safer by these reform efforts. So don't just talk to the uh, elected officials whom you happen to agree with or who happen to be members of your own party, make sure you stay engaged in local, state, and federal elections and that you are communicating to your elected officials that police reform should be and must be a, a priority. I think we're seeing more of a bipartisan political appetite for police reform, including on the use of force, but it won't happen without sustained public attention and demand for change. Uh, I want to open this up to both of you. Um, Scott, I think you're actually on mute. Um, yeah, sorry Seth, about I know that. you did a segment last year on the Patriot Act, which um, is both informative and entertaining, of course, because it's <laughs> Tom Um That was really that was really tough, by the way, because he it, he's a comedian, and I kept laughing, and he'd yell at me for la he didn't really yell, but he'd yell at me for laughing, be like, "Dude, you can't laugh." I was like, ah, "Okay, right." So I'm supposed to sit here. <laughs> in front of a really fun, yeah, anyway, sorry, but go ahead, Tola, sorry no, to cut you off. No, you're fine. Um, and, you know, in that segment, you're talking about police training. Um, so I guess my question for both of you is how important does police training, or how much of a role does police training play in this conversation, in terms of mindset going out in the streets and dealing with individuals, um, extending obviously to qualified immunity, but of course as well to excessive use of force. Yeah, Scott, um, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I'll take it. After. Yeah, I, I'll let you, you know, you can, obviously you have a lot more um, information, you know, as, as far as that goes. But, you know, for me, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just speaking as a person right now, not necessarily as an attorney. I'm just speaking as somebody that's trying to, to pay attention and, and, and see what's going on. Um, I totally uh, understand that, that from my perspective, I've, I feel like there has to be um, major reform and it starts with training um, to that end. Um, you know, I, I think that I think the, for me, the way I think it's such a complicated issue with the underlying issues on so many different socioeconomic um, reasons that that are, that are problematic, that to me, it's one of those situations where um, training alone won't fix it uh, from my perspective. I, I, I firmly believe that there has to be reform in the policing community to the point that, from my perspective, they're one of the highest paid, most desirable jobs in the country. Um, I think that the, the task uh, of being a peace officer is, is incredibly difficult, made ever more difficult with severely underfunding training um, and, and oftentimes uh, getting, uh, you know, good recruits, but oftentimes not getting the, the, you know, the, you know, the recruits that are going to Stanford or, or going to Wall Street, you know, to make the big bucks or, or, or going to do whatever it is they're going to do. And, and, and I think there, there certainly are people in the profession that could go those other ways, but I think that it becomes a matter of the policy, the training has to be improved. But, but I think as a whole, um, we, there is so much responsibility to uphold the Constitution that we have bestowed upon police officers at this point um, that to me 
we need to recognize that as a whole, uh, regardless of, you know, some little town in the sticks or whether you're in New York City, that we're doing everything we can to make sure that the people that are walking around with a pistol and a taser and enforcing the law are the best and the brightest that this country has. And, and they're trained to the highest level of ability because we're saying, but for this document that's written and the written documents or, or precedent that goes with it from court laws, there, there is no rule of law unless the people that we task with enforcing it accurately and, and properly enforce it. So to me, it has to be not only the policy, but we've got to do whatever we can to make it the most desirable, one of the most desirable jobs in the country where people are saying, that's what I want to do. I'm going to make a ton of money. Um, I'm going to be well-trained and, and I'm going to, I'm going to be executing uh, the law in a way that, it, that protects everyone. Um, I think that's really the only solution from my, my perspective. Yeah, I, I second Scott's training, uh, Scott's point that we need we need more training, uh, but the training by itself isn't enough. And sometimes what we need is different training. So I want to hit very quickly on, on all those points. Um, in the aftermath of uh, the, the the summer of 2014, and uh, that had a number of police uh, incidents there, uh, Tamir Rice, John Crawford, uh, uh, Eric Garner was shortly after, and, and so on. Uh, I wrote an op-ed called How Police Training Contributes to Avoidable Death. Sometimes our officers are trained to do the wrong thing, or they're trained in a way that contributes to, uh, what, uh, to deaths that, that could have been avoided. A significant amount of police training, and we should acknowledge that there are 650 different police academies across the country and 18,000 different police agencies, so there's a lot of variation. But a significant amount of police training has historically been very fear-based training. Officers are told from very early on that anyone and everyone they meet has the ability to kill them and may be willing to kill them. That every encounter is a potential armed or deadly force encounter until they're sure that it's not. That they need to be hyper vigilant and constantly stay on their guard. And there is something to that because police do operate in what can be a high risk uh, a set of circumstances. But it's simply not the case that that risk is equally distributed across all encounters such that officers should approach everyone with uh, hypervigilance. Unfortunately, it's very, very difficult to take a fear-based approach to training and also at the same time tell officers, go out, talk to community members, and build meaningful relationships. How can you build a meaningful relationship with someone who you have been told to be hyper vigilant of who is able and may be willing to kill you, right? So we have a mixed messaging problem. We need to shift the focus of police training, giving officers the skills and tools that they need to do risk assessment, but not exaggerating the risks the way that we have that leads to uh, or, or certainly contributes to a very adversarial, what can be a very adversarial approach to, to policing. Also, we can't just rely on training. The officers who killed George Floyd were not trained to do what they did. If anything, although I have not reviewed that file, I would be very surprised if they weren't trained to not do exactly what they did. We know that in 2013, Minneapolis police officers killed a man named David Smith in very similar circumstances. Uh, excuse me, 2013 is when the city of Minneapolis paid out a $3 million settlement related to that death. And we know that at the time, Minneapolis Police Department trained officers on the risks of keeping someone in that prone face down position with their hands cuffed behind their back, which can contribute to positional and compression asphyxia. But it didn't seem to matter, even though Derek Chauvin was an officer in the Minneapolis Police Department at the time who presumably would have gone through that training. So training by itself is not enough. We need more than training and we need more than policy. We need that to be part of police culture. We need peer intervention to be part of police culture. And we need supervisors to be attuned for policy violations and to actually discipline officers when they identify policy violations. I don't mean fire an officer as soon as they violate the first policy, but intercede, correct, 
counsel, discipline with increasing severity if the problem continues. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, we have policies and training that just end up as paper tigers. They exist, officers know about them, but they get ignored in the realities of policing on the street. Wow, I, um, I am overwhelmed with all this information and I think it just shows us all like how much more there is that we need to research and learn um, you know, about what the best way to do this is. I mean, but I think it's clear that there's certainly a need um, for some kind of regulation um, of this use of force. We clearly, at least in South Carolina, don't have any really right now, any at all um, in terms of laws. Um, and and I wanna just bring up one more point, um, Seth. So we have many police departments, many police agencies all over this country. We have many, many just in here in the Charleston Tri-County area. We have a significant amount. Um, and it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but each agency is able to use their discretion and how and what their policies are with everything, pretty much, including use of force. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is that is basically true. There's a lot of variation, and there's uh, a lot of room for variation for agencies to to take very different approaches to things. Like the, the Charleston Police Department and the North Charleston Police Department, as you guys know, are not the same agency. And yeah. so if there was a law in the books um, that regulated how use of force can be implemented, those agencies would at least in that sense be forced to abide at least by what the law is. Is that right? Yeah, there would be a minimum standard that officers would have to meet uh, as a matter of state law, a minimum standard that agencies would have to meet as a matter of state law. Agencies could, of course, exceed the minimum standards in state law. They could provide additional protections for civil rights by adopting more restrictive policies. Uh, but at least we would have a, 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 a statutory standard, something that the legislature developed uh, to, to set that baseline. And can you just explain, um, I know we're running way over, but I just want the viewers to understand. So how would that be different if the federal government passed a law um, that's federal that delineates what use of force is? And how would that affect South Carolina or any other state? Yeah, so here we get into something uh, that's a little bit convoluted, but it's called the anti-commandeering rule. Congress has limited ability to pass laws. I know it doesn't seem like that sometimes, but they really do. Uh, Congress can only pass laws when the Constitution allows them to pass laws. And they, uh, Congress cannot uh, require states to do something or can't require state actors like local police officers to do something unless the Constitution gives Congress the power to force the states to do something. So what that means is Congress could pass a law give, governing uh, police uses of deadly force that would apply to federal officers, but the same law wouldn't apply to state or local police officers. But here's what they can do. What Congress could do is pass a law that, that applies to federal officers and then tell the states you also have to adopt on your own. You have to enact state law equivalents of that federal law. You have to do the same thing or very close to the same thing that we just did. If you don't do that, we're going to stop funding criminal justice grants in your state. Congress can use the power of the purse to incentivize, although it cannot force, states and local governments to do things. And in fact, it has already done that. The reason that every state in the country has a 0 0.08 blood alcohol content for DUI is because Congress conditioned highway funding on that number. Uh, same thing with seatbelt laws and speed limits. Congress conditioned highway funding on states passing relevant laws. So we could see something very similar in the context of police use of force. And it doesn't even have to be limited to use of force. We could see something very similar for term, uh, in the context of minimum training requirements. Congress could say, for example, states must provide, well, excuse me, 
states should provide a minimum of 30 weeks of training for officers in their police academies. And any state that requires less than that does not get criminal justice funding. It's totally possible. What we don't have is the political will. They could even go a step further in creating the certification process. Absolutely. That you have to pass this certification. So take it out of the power of the states to create their individual policies that may or may not fit into an unfunded mandate or or whatever it ends up being calculated. Um, And and if I may back up for just a second with respect to what y'all can do. One, um, you know, uh, you know, People don't realize that if you want to run for big office, yeah, that's that's a pain, um, and, and and not everyone is cut out for that. Um, but there are almost limitless offices that every year go with hardly anyone running against them. Um, and whether you want to run or not, they're out there, um, and and there's very little competition. But moreover, um, I told Ali prior to this, I, I did economic planning for the state of Georgia prior to coming here, and the reason I tell you that is because my job was to create plans for how to get. Um, grants or otherwise stimulate the economy in small areas of uh, cities throughout Southeast Georgia. And we would go to all, we would do all these plans. They didn't have economics departments. We would do it all for them. And we'd go to present these plans and, you know, a town that might have, you know, a million dollars worth of revenue in a year uh, in taxes, you know, we're there to present how the federal government and the state government want to give them $20 million to redevelop an area of their town. I mean, you know, 20 times what they take in every year. And there would be one person from the community that would show up. Nobody goes to these things. Charleston, the city of Charleston, is the most motivated city I've ever seen. People don't go, generally speaking, and complain about things. If you go and you're consistent and you preach a consistent message and it's measured and you, you know, it's well thought out, I promise you, you will be more received than you think you are. And then it just requires the endurance to keep going. But um, I do think people under... Um, undersell the effect they can have just as a voice going to those meetings. And, and not just the meetings, particularly with policing. Uh, go to town hall meetings where the police uh, chief or police officers are presenting. Email the chief of police. Interact with the, the command staff. Um, policing is hyper-localized, which does create some problems, but it also does allow for the possibility of a police agency being highly responsive to local concerns. But if no one is raising those concerns, if no one is actually airing their their grievances or their hopes or their ambitions and their aspirations for what policing should look like, then the agency just has to either keep doing what they've always been doing or make it up as they go. So I, I totally agree with everything Scott just said there. There are many ways to engage, but that is key. Well, I I can't thank both of you enough. Um, This was incredibly informative. Um, We're going to be, this is recorded. We're going to be putting this on our website. It's going to still be on Facebook Live. Um, We encourage you guys to email us at sc4cjr at gmail.com if you have any other questions that I'm sorry we didn't get to today. Um, But I want to give our two speakers an opportunity and I, I like to ask this, if there's one thing that you want people really to take away from what you were saying today, um, what, what, would, what would that be? And I know that's putting you on the spot, um, but what, what do you want people to know? You know, this is a difficult time that everyone's going through. I mean, we haven't seen this, most of us in our lifetime, our parents' lifetime, um, and it's, it's scary for a lot of people. Um, but it's also good in some ways because people are definitely aware. Um, what kind of you know, comfort or hope can we give you know, viewers and, and the public that things can improve um, and how we can do that? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Scott. Go for it. No, you go ahead. Oh. Fine. All right, so it is really difficult to watch a video like the bystanders video of George Floyd and feel optimistic. Uh, and I'm not going to urge unbridled optimism. I am going to urge cautious optimism, though, because policing looks very different today than it did in the civil rights movement, and policing looks very different today than it did in prohibition, and policing looks very different today than it did in the 1890s when we started the country's first uh, opiate epidemic. Policing has improved, and if we keep at it, it will continue to improve. 
it is not where it should be. It is not where it needs to be. It's not in a place that we, the public, uh, deserve, let alone expect. But it is moving that way. The problem is the pace of movement. So we can try to encourage that pace, uh, but we shouldn't get discouraged that it's, that it's happening slower than we want. Positive change almost always happens slower than we want it to. And what allows me to, and I'm not really exaggerating about this, what allows me to go to sleep at night sometimes is the idea that this uncertainty and, and outrage are growing pains for the country as we continue to evolve as a nation. I hope that's the case. Uh, I remain cautiously optimistic that that's the case, but without a lot of continued attention to it, we're going to have maybe three steps forward, two steps back, uh, which we've also seen before in policing. And that's something that I, I would like to avoid. You know, we, we saw outrage when Rodney King was beaten and the officers were initially acquitted in the state trial. We saw outrage when Amadou Diallo was shot when uh, Walter Scott was shot, Tamir Rice was shot. We should be better than we are, but that doesn't mean we're not heading in the right direction. It just means we're not heading in the right direction quickly enough. Uh, and I will, I will leave you with um, one of my favorite uh, Martin Luther King Jr. quotes, which uh, I bring up to my students as we talk about police reform. And I'm going to intentionally emphasize something here. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you, Seth. Scott, how about you? Yeah, you know, I would agree. I would say that it is. it was you know, very troubling to watch that video. Um, equally for me, uh, as an attorney who's still on the sidelines at Marion Square on Sunday, um, it, it sometimes it takes pause and say, are we making the progress that I thought we were making in certain aspects? And, and I will tell you this, uh, you know, this is the first time that I've really uh, spoken out and, and gotten more to, to be a little more of an activist, I would say, uh, certainly not as much as I probably should be. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, as humans, we kind of operate under the not in my backyard adage far too often. Um, and it's easy for us, um, no matter what lock of life, no matter where we live, no matter what we do, um, to be insulated in our own little world for a myriad of different reasons. I am, I am cautiously optimistic that we're at the point where this is not a conversation that people want to just sweep under the rug and say, uh, you know, I, I was talking to some people the other day, there are all the names right um and and sadly since the george floyd incident i i'm sure there's been countless ones that we're not even aware of okay and that's not there's been probably millions of interactions with police so i'm not saying they're all bad but what i'm saying is that we i think we finally reached a point hopefully a society where we're not simply saying oh that was that was a tragedy to happen to that one person wish that hadn't happened to that person and move on i I'm optimistic as a society we're recognizing that it's not just about the one person. The one person is maybe what gets us talking, but it is about, uh, you know, the, the entire comprehensive systemic situation that exists on so many different levels. So for that, I'm really, you know, I, I am optimistic um, in that sense. Um, I am still quite concerned with the fact that force is so readily available um, to law enforcement and that so much of our population is so willing to readily um, support force used by the police or, or by anyone. Because I will tell you this as an, you know, an amateur com uh, constitutionalist, we have a, a system that is by no means perfect, um, but, but it, in, in the most idealistic form, it's about as perfect as you're going to get in the sense that um, if the law and the documents as written are interpreted in a fair and just manner for everyone, um, it creates a very equitable system, okay? That does not mean equal. It means a very equitable, means very fair for all walks of life because people know the rules of the game. 
talk about rules of engagement earlier. I think that's why there's less for military. People know what they can and can't do in the military, right? And whether it's the police or anyone else is violating your constitutional rights, I think one of the biggest um, things that we have got to do um, is to know those rules and to enforce them and to realize that um, what makes this country the, the potential that it has is that even level playing field. And that applies to everyone. And so if anyone is pushing an agenda, um, no matter how good your cause is, um, that by way of the agenda one is pushing um, infringes on the other person's equal protection under the law, we're just perpetuating the cycle in a new direction. So my message is, whatever, for whatever reason that you're on this call and for whatever your personal message is, just remember that there's strength in numbers. And the greatest way that we can exercise our strength is to uphold the liberties of the Constitution for everyone. Um, because then everybody knows the rules and everybody can demand equal enforcement of that rule. Um, and so that, that's the key. It's just remember that if, 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 if one person takes your liberty or you take someone else's particular liberty and whatever issue it is, that same thing can happen to you um, for, for everything. You know, the English don't have a constitution. I think it's because all my good friends that are English are real hoity and they say, oh, we don't need one. We don't need what they call enumerated rights, written rights. Because we're so good, we would never infringe on your rights. Well, until that government changes. Germany says they're a great country. You can't deny things in history. If you want to be an antagonist, you're not allowed to deny things in history. So there's, there's different situations you have to deal with in, in, in every country. And I think this one has the best chance of being an even playing field. And I hope so, because I consider myself a moderate. I know my wife considers myself, uh, both of us to be moderates. And, and if, if America is not a country for moderates, I don't know where in the world I will go. So I just ask that everybody that is demanding change, right on, I totally support the, the efforts that are remaining on, on so many different issues, because I think progressive is a positive thing that far too many people say is a negative. Anyway, just remember that, that there's strength in numbers and um, an equal playing field will get everyone further along. So Scott, that's my soapbox. Scott, Seth, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us, to educate us, to share um, your stories and your experiences. It has been invaluable for us. We're so grateful at SC for CJR. I know that all of our viewers are, are chiming in and saying how amazing it was and how appreciative they are and thankful for you guys coming on and sharing this information. Um, we are so grateful for you. You know, at SC for CJR, we are nonpartisan. We're grassroots. We don't take any funding. We are depend on all of you to come in here, to get educated, to share your experiences with everyone else. So the power numbers, so that we all can work together um, to make our state, our country better um, so that these injustices don't happen. Um, reach out to us, visit us on, um, on scforcjr.org. We're on Twitter, we're on TikTok now. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> if you wanna check that out, um, Instagram, Twitter. Um, Facebook, of course, and we're so grateful. We're going to be putting up um, information about our speakers on our website and on our Facebook page and other social media forums, including um, the works um, that Professor Stoughton has written and links to those. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night and thanks for tuning in. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.